Hi, and welcome back to Intro to Programming. This is part two of this series. My name is Adam Compton, and today we're going to be resuming where we left off last time. Today we're going to be talking about three new concepts here, list, arrays, and maps, scope, and classes and object-oriented programming. The first one there is more of, last time we talked about individual variables and things of that nature. This time is, what if you want to store a lot of uh, similar types of values together under one variable name? How can you do that? Well, you do that with these objects. Next, we're going to talk about scope, which is local versus global. There's a lot more to it than that, but those are the more common concepts. And we will talk about that when we get to it. It is an area that a lot of people seem to get confused. Finally, we're going to talk about classes and object-oriented programming. Uh, this is how you can define a new type of variable, uh, what kind of functions go along with it, inheritance. So let's go ahead and get started here. So if you want to group things, well, if it's just a single item, you, want, you can use a single variable. Well, if you have multiple unassociated items, let's say somebody's age, somebody's name, the color of their car, something like that, well, you'd use different variables for each one of those. Well, let's say you had a group of similar items like the names of everybody in a classroom or the names of all of your pets or, I don't know, the ages of everybody in your family, something like that, where it's a similar type of object that you're wanting to combine. You can reference all those as a single group variable. And that's where list arrays and maps, oh my. These are going to be definitions that are somewhat similar across um, all programming languages. Some programming languages do vary here. For example, what a Python program or the Python language calls a list or an array differs from here. It kind of gets shifted around a little bit. Uh, sometimes you'll hear things called maps which are different than what we're defining here. But in general terms, this is what people are looking at when they're or thinking of when they're thinking of lists, arrays, and maps. For example, a list is a sequence of variables grouped together under a single name. Just as I said, you have a bunch of names or you have a bunch of numbers like people's ages, something like that. You can group them all together under one variable. And we'll show this a little bit in a moment. An array is the same concept, but it is a fixed size region of continuous storage containing a grouping of variables. What that means is, whereas a list, if you think of it in memory terms, in computer memory, a list, you're actually just grabbing several little segments out of memory to store the variables that are linked together. This is typically called a linked list, or list for short. Whereas an array, typically, is a single contiguous block of memory. It's not separ several little separate pieces that are joined together. No, it's one long block of memory that is used to store this. And as such, it usually cannot be resized and things of that nature. Thus, the fixed size region part. This is not true with all programming languages, but for most, it will stand true. Uh, and then you have a map, which is sometimes called an associative array or a dictionary, depending on the programming language. In Python, in particular, it is called a dictionary. And in the follow-on videos, we will be talking more about that. And it is a set of key value pairs. Uh, what that means is if you have, let's say, going back to the example of you want to store everybody's age. Well, you could do that as a list or an array, depending on if you know the maximum number or not. And you store all of them in there. But then you don't have any association with that. You don't know whose uh, age that is. Well, if you use something like a map, you could store the name would be the key, the value would be the age. You store a sequence of those. Therefore, you could determine uh, whose age is uh, which in there. So let's go ahead and move on to the next one. Common attributes of list, arrays, and maps. Uh, for example, you have operations such as adding, removing, length, or indexing, uh, depending on the programming language and the type of object you're dealing with. It could be something to add it such as push or append or add or concatenate, something like that. Uh, removing would be something like pop or remove or delete. Length is a common attribute in most programming languages or it is a function that you can apply to a list or array that will tell you the number of objects contained within it. 
and then indexing. In most cases, it's going to be that square bracket, square bracket, where you can type in a number. If you look over at the right-hand side of the screen here, I define three different objects at the top. The first one would probably be a list or possibly an array, depending on what language you're talking about. There again, uh, functionality, they tend to be about the same. Just depends on some of the extra characteristics, like can you resize them, things of that nature. But for this case, I'll use them interchangeably. You have A, which is a sequence of powers of 2 there. Uh, 1, 2, 4, 8, 16, 32, 64. Next one is just a string. Uh, this is a list as well. The third one is that map or that dictionary or associative array. You can see that I say Adam has the value of 10, Bob has the, 10, uh, the value of 20, and Alice has the value of 30. Now, if we were going to print out some value in here, you would use indexing to index into each of these uh, objects. Keep in mind, most programming languages, when you do indexing, start counting at zero. So if I wanted to print out a sub two, or the second index, or index two of a, you would start with counting out zero. So you would have, this would be zero, that would be one, that would be two. So we'd print four. Same thing with object B. If I want to print index five, it would be one, I mean zero, then one, then two, then three. The space would be four. And then the I is index sub five. Because remember, everything starts at zero. All right. And then if you're uh, printing out an associative array or map or dictionary, you put in the indexing brackets, you put in the key that you're wanting to look up. In this case, we're looking up Bob. So it scans through that array, looks for Bob, and pulls out the 20 that is associated with it. So that's how this works in general. Yes, uh, you can get fancier and uh, more complicated with this, and you can have list of lists. You can have associated array or maps that the values are actually other dictionaries or other lists. So it can get very convoluted very quickly depending on what you're wanting to store. Then of course you have other characteristics such as are, is the data ordered, um, meaning is there a particular order that you want it to go into uh, that falls into sorting. Uh, sometimes when you add values to a list it automatically sorts them by alphanumeric sorting algorithm or it might do it through some other algorithm that you may uh, specify. There's lots of other characteristics that can fall in there, but this is the most common uh, variance that you'll see there. Let's move on into the next concept, which is scoping. So what is the deal with scoping? As I'm going through programming myself, learning it in college and at work, uh, helping colleagues and uh, other students with it, having teach it to other people, this is one of the areas that so many people get hung up on. They don't understand or they can't get their mind around what is scope and why is it when I define a variable in one location, it isn't usable in another location or the values change. Well, that's because of how programming languages use the scope of a variable. And that's it when we were discussing scope, we're discussing the scope of var variables most commonly. Sometimes functions, if they're nested functions, things of that nature. But, for example, there are so many kinds of these, or types. First, let's start with an expression scope. In here, you can see there's a function called f that all it does is return the value 10. The following line there, where we say x equals int y equals f semicolon y times y. This is an inline function function, declaration, expression, depending on what terms you want to use. In here we define y as an integer and it is storing the value of f. We know that returns 10, so y equals 10. Then it executes y times y, so 10 times 10. So x in the end, at the end result of this would be 100. As you can see within that expression we're defining a variable y and then we're using it, and then at the end of that expression, that integer y disappears. It is no longer stored in memory. That integer y is only valid within that expression. That is called an expression scope. 
The block scope. Block scope is very similar to expression scope. However, as opposed to having all the commands and variables defined in one expression that is contained, a block is broken out and you can see it here. For example, in this one we have ret for return value equals zero. And then we define a for loop, which is for n equals one, while n is less than 10, increment n, n plus plus there. Inside of that, we're defining what n is. That n value is defined for that for block. Inside of that, then, we also have integer or int, m equals n times n. We define the return value, ret, is plus equals m. That means you take whatever it was and you add m to that. Outside of the for loop, we now return the ret. What we see in there is a couple different um, variables that uh, or scopes that we can deal with. First, the return, ret, is actually defined outside of the for block, so it can be used outside the for block, as you can see here, inside the for block, and then back outside the for block. So that is not a block scoped variable. However, int n and int m both are defined within the scope of that for block and can only be used within that for block. If down here outside the for block, instead of returning rec, ret, we tried to return n or m, we would get an error because this is outside of that for block where the n and m are defined within scope. Once that for block terminates, n and m go away. The memory location is freed up. The only values that we have left are ret. All right, and then after that, we have function scope, which is, again, very similar to block, which was very similar to expression, but it's just expanded out a little bit. Here, to demonstrate this, we have two different functions. First one is called square, which takes a variable n, then it multiplies it by itself and then returns that value. It squares that number. Then we have another function called sum of squares, which again takes a variable n. Within that it defines two variables, sets them to zero, total and i. Then it says while i is less than or equal to n, add the square of i to total and then increment i and you do that while i is less than n. Finally you return total. So, what we're going to show here is sum of squares is the one you would call. You would call it with some variable, let's call it 3 or something like that, n equals 3. And then it comes down through here, it says i less than 3, it starts out i is 0, that's fine. Total plus equals square of i. Well, you're passing in whatever i is up here, but you see this variable n is here. Was that the same variable n is here? No. This variable n is only defined within the scope of this function, whereas this n is only defined within the scope of this function. Once you pass off to another function, that is stacked and stored onto memory, stored away until this function finishes, then it returns, and then that would be added to total, at which point this n comes back within scope, and you can process again. Like I said, it can be a little confusing, and the more you work with it, the more you will understand it. But this is the basic concepts of how this is working. You have to define what scope or what block or logical context you're in. Whereas with the expression, it is all within one expression. Within a block, it's within a block, in this case a for block or a while block, something of that. Here, it is stored within the scope of a particular function. Okay, each one of these is just building upon the other. After that, we have a file scope. There's no demonstration for the rest of these or code uh, examples, but for a file scope, sometimes you'll have multiple files that you'll write while you're building a program. And you can define, for some programming languages, variables that only exist within that file. For any function or any commands you want to execute within that file, that variable stands true. There is a scope for that file. Module is something similar to file. Sometimes you might have each module as its own file and something you define in there as the in the module scope 
would exist for everything within that module. Sometimes a module is a single file, sometimes it's multiple files, sometimes there's multiple modules in a single file. All depends on the programming language. Here again, you're just looking for where that variable is defined or where that function is defined. Sometimes functions can be defined as part of a scope. Uh, that is definitely the case when we're talking about object-oriented programming, which we'll talk about in a little bit. But here again, just pay attention to where that is defined. Moving on to the next one is global. As with each of these, we've been building up this grandioseness of where the scope can lead you to. In global scope, that's something that when defined, it exists for all functions, all variables, all scopes within a particular program. It exists at the global level. If you want to learn more about scope, there's plenty of reference material on the internet, plenty of uh, computer science books that you can reference. If you wish to contact me directly, I can try to uh, give you some references or I can try to talk with you about how to handle scope or how to identify the scope of a particular program or variable or function. Next, object-oriented programming. I pulled this from Wikipedia, but it is object-oriented programming is a programming paradigm based on the concept of objects, which may contain data in the form of fields, often known as attributes, and code in the form of procedures, often known as methods. One thing I'd like to say here is the concept of procedures or methods, that is uh, just a tendency for programmers to call functions different names based on where they're located. Sometimes functions that are in a global scope are named one thing. Functions within a class are known as methods or within modules. Ultimately, they are all functions or methods or procedures, whatever you want to call them. They are all the same concept. It's just what scope are they defined within. What are some common uh, programming languages that use object-oriented programming? Well, I can't give a complete list here because there's so many of them. Uh, go out to Wikipedia, look it up. There's tons of them. The more common ones you'll see are things like Java, C++, C Sharp, Python, Ruby, Perl, and as I said, many, many more. Uh, the one in particular we're going to be talking about as we go along is Python, but uh, some of these aren't fully object-oriented programs, like Python technically isn't, C++ technically isn't full object-oriented, but it can be a object-oriented programming language. It has many object-oriented programming characteristics. Programs like C Sharp and Java definitely are full object-oriented programming languages. So what are some of the basic concepts that people will talk about or discuss with relationship to object-oriented programming? Well, in this, you have the basic concept, which is a class. A class is a definition for the, well, it defines the data format and available functions for a given type or class of object, as well as the data and associated functions. That's a lot of garbly gook, but that may not make sense. What it means is the basic concept between and behind object-oriented programming is you're defining a new variable type. Let's say we want to define, define a new variable called pet. Um, just as we have integer, string, uh, map, or dictionary, things like that, we want to define a new one called pet. Well, what are the things that we need to know about a pet? Well, pets have a name, they have a gender, they have an age, they have a type. Are they a cat, a dog, what have you? Uh, what well, some of the things you can do with a pet? You can feed it, you can pet it, you can take care of it, things like that. So all these things are part of a pet class. Uh, you need to define them, you need to describe them, you need to define how they interact, things of that nature. Next would be an object. It is an instance of a class. When you instantiate a class, you produce an object. Same thing as a string. The concept of string, the string class, is not an object. It is a class. When you say new string and then you define it as, hi, my name is Bob, that is the string, you, then you have an instance of a string class. So you have an object there. That is the object. It's a, just semantics. Uh, one is the idea. One is the instantiated version of it. Class is the idea, 
object is the instantiated version. As I said before, within a class you have variables, you can have methods, functions, procedures, whatever you want to call them. Um, some other things in there that's going to fall into place are inheritance, which uh, can also apply to polymorphism, parents, descendants, things of that nature. Uh, we'll talk about a little bit of that in the next slide here. Things can get really convoluted when you get into inheritance and polymorphism, but I'll try to touch on it quickly over the next slide here. So going back to the pet concept, let's define here on the left a new class called pet. A pet has a variable called age, one called name, and one called gender. I define age as an integer, name as a string, and gender as a character. So male, female, M, or L, something of that nature. Uh, function, we have one defined function here, and it is a constructor. Most classes will have a constructor, depending on the language you're dealing with. It will have a very unique name such as in Python, it's underscore, underscore, I-N-I-T, underscore, underscore. Here, I'm just using the generic term construct to define that. And you can see it takes in a name, age, and a gender. Within there, I define self.name equals name, self.age equals age, and self.gender equals gender. This is something that's fairly common across most object-oriented programming languages. Within the class, if you want to reference within itself, other functions or other class variables, you prepend it with self dot. That says that this is the pet's name, the pet's age, the pet's gender, something of that nature, as opposed to the variables that are being passed in on the perimeter line there. What I mean is this name here is not the same name as this one here. It will be once this self.name equals name is issued, but that says set this name and store it in this variable here. There again, scope is important. Be careful with that. Then of course we have another function called speak because all pets can try to speak or they will make a noise of some kind, but still. Now let's define two additional descended classes. First one is called cat. It is of type pet. Notice pet has no sub has no parent type here, but cat does. Cat is of type pet. And here we call the function construct. It, again, it takes name, age, and gender. And the next thing I do in here is what I call super. Within that construction uh, object or uh, function, the first thing I do is I call the super name, age, gender. That says pass name, age, and gender to the constructor of the super class or the parent class, which would be pet. So when you declare a new type of, or new object of cat and you pass a name, age, and gender, it goes to this function, which then gets sent back over here to pet to its constructor of name, age, and gender. So it defines them here. Keep a note, anything that is defined within pet is also available within cat because it is a descendant of pet. Over here, you have a sibling class of cat which is also a descendant of pet, we call it fish. Again, it is of type pet, same thing. We have a constructor of name, age, gender, which all it does is call the super constructor up here over in pet of name, age, gender. And it has a function called swim. Here again, cat is not a fish, so therefore they have different functions. They can have different variables, things of that nature, but they are both pets. So they all have name, age, gender, a constructor, they try to speak, a cat can meow, a fish can make burbling sounds, I guess, but still, you can see how this is. Within programming languages, sometimes you have a concept of is type of or is uh, object of, something like that. You can say, if you want to know if a cat is a pet, you can say, when you've defined a new cat object, let's call it C, you can say, is C of type pet? In this case, well, yes, C is of type cat, but it is also of type pet, which means it has all these functions as well. But if you said, is cat of type fish, it would come back, no, it would come back as an error or false, something like that, because cat is not a descendant of fish. They are a descendant of the same parent class, but not of each other. So that's how polymorphism, that's how inheritance and all that works at a very generic level. Moving on, 
coming up next. This is going to be it for this uh, intro to programming set of videos. I know I went very fast and very high level on a lot of these concepts, but there again, I wanted to get through that to get a baseline for everybody to the kind of concepts and topics I'm going to be discussing as we go into Python programming. My next one or two videos are going to be on the intro to the concepts of Python programming, kind of things that make it a little different than other languages, how they're implemented in there, things of that nature, such as the peculiarities of the language, the difference between Python 2 versus Python 3, some of the common libraries you're going to be using, uh, how do you input, how do you prompt the user for input, how do you output to the screen, things of that nature. Uh, we'll go into some basic file I.O., stuff like that. Once we're done with the intro to Python programming, then we'll actually go into the next series, which is Python programming for pen testers, where we'll delve into socket communications, uh, using Scappy to interact with that, do some web scraping, and that's all down the road. But first, we'll have to get into some intro to Python programming and uh, get that under our belt, and then we'll move on from there. So. Thank you all for your time. If you have any questions, please use the comments uh, field below. If you want to stay updated as I come out with new programming videos here, please hit the subscribe button. Uh, the like button below also lets me know that people like these videos and I will continue doing these videos. So please have a great time and uh, thank you for watching and have a great day and I'll talk to you next time.